Yeah, um, I'm just going to, uh, like, like Andy's talk, um, that refreshingly mine's got no woody debris in it at all. Um, I'm going back uh, to, to fundamental principles here, just talking about um, a few projects that I've done um, in recent years um, that come under the title of, of natural river restoration, really, for want of a better, better word, word for it, or a better phrase for it. And basically these projects are about uh, re-establishing the natural features uh, of a river. It's taking it right back to, to fundamentals that a lot of our rivers, uh, and, and generally here I'm talking about lowland rivers, alluvial rivers rather than, than upland ones, um, that they're, they're the wrong shape because they've been made the wrong shape by man over um, many years of, of intervention and management for things like flood defence and uh, land drainage and essentially a lot of them have been straightened and uh, they've been uh, made into, if you cut a cross section and looked at it, it would look like a tra trapezoid shape, basically uh, lacking any sort of um, diversity in terms of depths. And um, th th these techniques uh, that we used on these projects are basically to re-establish these natural features like meanders, pools and riffles, vertical banks on the outside of bends, connection to the floodplain, which has often been uh, uh, removed when engineering schemes have taken place uh, on these previously dredged and, and straightened rivers. And this is rather than the use of uh, sort of more conventional techniques, if you like, like deflectors and vanes that have been installed within an altered channel, or the dig and dump that Andy was talking about, about moving the bed around to create the, that, that diversity. It, it, it's taking it, the river back to the the natural, the, or as natural as you can get, a state and restoring the natural function of the channel that preserves those features that you're looking for. So it, it's, as I've phrased it here, it's remaking the river in a, in a natural form uh, using the principles of, of geomorphology, which is uh, basically the, the, the shape and, and processes that, that, that shape a river. The reason for the asterisks there on, on natural is uh, that um, it's often not back to a totally natural state because there are always constraints, but the methods that, uh, that, that have been used and that I've learned over the last few years, it's possible to, to work within those constraints and get it as natural as you can. And it's possible to engineer it so that the, the, they will, the, the projects that you uh, create will remain stable uh, in that form as long as you stick to these principles. Uh, as I've said, it's, it's uh, lowland rivers in particular that are amenable to these techniques. It's not impossible on upland rivers. Gareth, my colleague, managed a, a project up in Cumbria that, uh, that did something very similar on much higher energy rivers. But it was a real eye-opener for me um, that, what, that just the, the scale of the positive outcomes that you could get from these techniques, they were above and beyond anything that I'd previously encountered on, on habitat restoration projects and they're eminently doable as well. It, it wasn't hard to, to do these things. Um, it was quite serendipitous really that the, how I came upon this was um, through, through meeting a chap called uh, Professor Richard Hay, uh, who's a very eminent uh, fluvial geomorphologist and uh, retired professor from the University of East Anglia. Um, and uh, he, he, if you look at the back of any geomorphology book, the huge list of references are, are accredited to, to Richard. Uh, but he started off life, or, or his professional life, as an engineer. So he's, uh, and, and he freely admits that he knows next to nothing about ecology or fish. Um, but we, we've, we've made a fairly good partnership in that, uh, with him sort of doing the technical aspects of the river design and, and me doing the project management and the consenting and basically making sure that he doesn't squash any water voles on the way. Um, this is the type of thing we're talking about. Um, th this is on the River Bain in uh, Lincolnshire, the Lincolnshire Wolds. So it, it is a, a chalky, chalky-ish stream. Um, and the, the, the sites that lend themselves to this kind of uh, restoration are where the river's been altered. In this case, it was an old mill uh, situated down here. And the former river channel followed this, roughly this red dotted line along here, uh, dropped over a weir into this mill pond here. Uh, and then again dead straight and under a, a road bridge there. Um, and 
This was one of Richard's designs here and, and working with Richard Osmond, the, the guy who lives in the mill there and a, a Wild Trout Trust member, um, we, we, we basically put the river back into, th this was a perched channel here, so this was higher than the valley floor. We put the river back along the valley floor and meandered it through there. He wanted to retain his mill pond there, so the, the, the water goes into that wider area and then meandered through here and rejoining the, the, the uh, the, the, the channel below the road. Um, this was done, uh, the design was done by Richard Hay. Uh, the work was actually project managed by the Lincolnshire Chalk Streams project, um, Ruth Craig, and uh, various other partners were involved in that. And, and that's one of the themes for, through all these projects. We've had, we've had great support from a wide variety of different partners uh, to, to get them delivered. Um, just a bit of uh, techie stuff, just to describe what's going on uh, with these projects. The natural alluvial rivers, they have these seven variables which are listed here. Um, and there's lots of equations on the interdependency of these variables. And fortunately for both you and me, uh, <laughs> this talk's much too short to describe them. But, but the, the take home message from it is that uh, this is your typical plan form of a, of a natural alluvial river where you've got meanders uh, and the pools are situated on the outside of the bends here where you've got scour uh, and the riffles are situated in between the pools uh, that with the sh you know retaining the material that's been scoured out from from the pools there and if you did a cross section across here you'd get the shallow beach area on the inside of the uh, of the bend there and the deeper water on the outside of the bend here and then a, a, a cross section across your riffle it's a much flatter profile uh, and and the, the the aspect that you don't see there is uh, that that's looking at, at looking down on it is the relationship to the flood plain as well is that when water levels come up uh, they spill out much more frequently onto the floodplain than in engineered rivers where the beds have the beds been lowered. Um, the take-home message is that uh, Richard's technique is to use these equations to, to design the river that's appropriate for the flow conditions and, and uh, the site that you find there. Um, but there's, there's a bit of a shortcut to that, and it is if you can find a, a, a reference reach where the river has either been unaltered or has been left alone for a long time and started to, to repair itself and put in new floodplain benches and things, you can take those measurements and they can be a bit of a surrogate for the, for the equations uh, or support the equations that allow you to produce a design for a stable river channel with, with a natural function. Uh, and like I said, the, this design is adjustable. So if there are constraints, like you can't put in uh, the size of meanders that you'd ideally like to, you can tweak the other variables to, uh, to, in that design and still end up with a stable river that isn't going to have excessive erosion or uh, you know, cause excessive flooding. And the, the positive outcomes that you get from these restorations are you, you restore a, a stable pool riffle sequence, um, you get a transport of fine sediment through the reach, so you don't get the big depositions of silt and, and things on the bed of the river, that is transported through the reach, but it does retain the coarser materials that you want, like the gravels on the riffles, and you don't get any silting over those riffles or the infilling of the pools with, with material that's been transported down the river, it's, it's transported through. You get floodplain connectivity, uh, slack water um, you know, uh, during flood events, um, and you know all those things have got obvious uh, habitat benefits. Uh, you know when you consider fry survival and egg survival and, and deep pools for adult fish and all that kind of thing. Um, it's a fundamental intervention. I mean, it's almost starting from scratch. It is starting from scratch, and you, you break some ecological eggs to make this omelette. Uh, if, if for, for want of a better phrase for that, but you are really um, you know, fundamentally designing the basic shape of the river so that in a stable way, that as it recovers from, from the project, you will get some really good habitat benefits. And the, I, I think it's justified because on these lowland systems that have been uh, modified, the time scale for natural recovery back to a, to a, 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 you know, a good state is millennia. 
because of the low energy of those rivers. A lot of them were formed by, you know, during the last glaciation. The ice has all melted. There isn't that volume of water anymore. They just haven't got the energy to, to, to recover. But the ecological recovery, when you pro do a proper restoration project, is very, very rapid, you know, a matter of a, a year or two. So just a quick flick through how it's done. Um, basically three stages, the design, which I've talked about, the project management of it, and then doing it. Uh, landowner liaison is really important. This is a site on the Upper Witham that we did in, in 2015, uh, owned by Neil McCorkadale, and he, he was very amenable to the project going ahead, but when he came down sort of a week into the project for the first time, his first phrase was, bloody hell, what are you doing? <laughs> and because it does look like uh, a war zone when, when the, the project is going, uh, it, it, in, in halfway through. But this is essentially the, the upper with them. Uh, this is LIDAR uh, showing the different river uh, levels. The brown line there is the original uh, river channel before we did any work. And there's a weir just there uh, that used to put power a hydraulic ram pump that pumped water up to the big house on the hill. Long since redundant. But this whole channel back here was very, very silty and shallow and pretty grotty habitat. Um, and the idea was to basically take it out and put it back into roughly its original course with meanders going back and, and dropping in back below the weir there, uh, which, we, which we did. And I'll show some pictures of that in a little while. Um, there's a lot of work up front in this. The d doing it is the easy bit, um, the, 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 you know, as long as you get a good, good contractor involved. So the, it's all about getting the consents, get, doing the flood modelling, um, the, to, to show that you're not going to increase flood risk, uh, tendering process. Medium-sized plant hire companies seem to be the best ones. They give good, really good value for money and they're extremely competent, um, you know, big, big enough to cope, small enough to care sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, the drive, uh, I've worked with three or four of these companies now and the drivers are, are, are incredibly skilled uh, at what they do. And then on the ground, it's a case of you've got your design, so it's marking that out. It's important to mark it out quite early on after you've got the design because you can suddenly find out that there's a huge oak tree or something in, in where you want to put the channel that wasn't marked on the map or something like that. So then you have to tweak the design and, and, and go around it. Uh, but it. Again, that's relatively easy to do with a good geomorphologist uh, on the project team. And strip off the topsoil, dig the new channel course down to 300 millimetres below your finished riffle levels. The pools are less critical. Um, you, you can you can dig those those down, but uh, and then you you uh, well you'll see in a minute. But what that what that three hundred millimeters is significant. You shape shape the pools on the outside of the bend so they have this sort of asymmetric cross section with the deep water on the outside of the bend and a, a little bench on the inside and then tapering up to your floodplain level there. And uh, then uh, creating these correct floodplain levels here. So these are the new bank levels. So that gives you an idea of how much um, you know the channel has been lowered because you've got to go, obviously got to bring this channel back into your original channel. The difference between the actual valley height there and your new floodplain levels, and that's the same. This is the project in Norfolk on the Glaven with the, the new floodplain levels there, and you can just see the gravel riffles that have been introduced. And then the final thing is introducing the gravel riffles and shaping them. And they're shaped in such a way so the water flumes off them into the pool and, and creates that scour that you want. And they also have the function that the height is critical because it sets the water height in the next pool upstream. So th this is the really critical bit is using your laser level to get, you know, you might have on this particular site, we had 30 riffles over the, the length of it. And um, there was about a 10 centimetre drop on each one. So you, you work into fairly fine tolerances and you can you, you know, you get it there or thereabouts with the digger and then fine tune it by raking. And then let the water in. Um, um, you know, this is always a good PR opportunity. Uh, and this was the, uh, at Bayfield in, in Norfolk uh, where we did that and, and got the, the great and the good down as they broke through. In terms of the ecological recovery, the, the, the project on the Glaven where we bypassed an estate lake in Norfolk uh, created a 1.2 kilometre channel around that lake, completed uh, late September 2014. The trout spawned on, the, on the, the introduced gravel that same year in November. 
there was a trout caught on rod and line on that section the following April and then Norfolk Rivers Trust did some electric fishing in the following June. Um, there's just the details there, but 90 trout were caught um, over two 90 metre sites, 80% of which were young of the year, so it presumably uh, you know, it was a result of this spawning. And also there were eels, brook lampreys, including transformers, which really surprised me because those had moved well into the, the channel. You think of those as being fairly sedentary. Lots of bullheads, including juveniles and a few others, and then you know, the associated other biodiversity as well. And that's uh, what it looked like in August uh, following, so just less than a year afterwards. And then I was there in December last year, and of the, there were 29 riffles there, and there was um, reds on over half of those, including this one here. And that, that channel there is um, five metres wide, so you get an indication of the sort of di the, the size. It's actually two reds. There's the, there's a hollow there and a, and a, a tail. Uh, of, of gravel and then there's an, another tail of gravel there so it looks like there's just a little bit of over you know by the same fish presumably a bit of overcutting gone on there but from from that point to that point it was about two and a half meters long that red so presumably that was a, a sea trout that had uh, done that so the, the, the projects that we've completed so far uh, a lot on the river glaven because we uh, had funding and a very keen local group there in, involved in that. So we did a project at Hunworth, which was introducing meanders. This is this project here. You can see it in high water, and that's the, the floodplain connectivity kicking in. Um, 400 metres, which was re very, very straight pit of river, which was just re-meandered. Glanford Mill, where we put in a fish pass and re-meandered the river through a former mill pond upstream. The big one at Bayfield, which was 1,200 metres. Um, the Bain, 500 metres, and the, the Witham in Lincolnshire, which was uh, 600 metres. Uh, and again, those distances, that you're actually increasing the river length. When we started, the river length there was 400 metres, but because of the meanders, you know, you're increasing it by significantly. And it's great for bypassing these barriers to migration. This is the one at, uh, in, on the Witham. That's the grotty habitat upstream of this weir. Uh, that was put in. So in terms of you know, fish passage, which is often a priority, uh, you know, particularly for environment agency targets, it's a no-brainer really. There's no point putting a fish pass on that uh, to get fish into habitat like that, when basically for a fraction of the cost, um, you could, you, you know, you get, you, you restore your fish passage and you create 600 metres of really good habitat. So, you know, you solve for, uh, get two birds with one stone. And, and there are a lot of other benefits as well, like floodplain connectivity, flood storage areas, that kind of thing, uh, you know, which tick a lot of boxes um, in, in other areas. And a, a really great thing if you can, uh, if you've got somebody uh, who's got a drone who can spare the time when they're not flying drugs into over prison walls, um, <laughs> the, uh, you can get some really good aerial shots. This is the, this is the Witham one here. Um, and that's just that the, the old channel has gone, but it was basically a straight channel that ran down the edge of these trees here, all the way down there. And the weir is about at that point there. And that's just an aerial shot of the new channel with the, the meanders restored to it. And that's the, that's the one at Bayfield. Uh, basically the River Glaven, this estate lake here, the valley was dammed at the bottom there and uh, it's just put a, the, the bypass channel all the way around yet retained the lake. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.